G'day mate, Luke Ford here. Got a book as our topic, A Return to Eros, The Radical Experience of Being Fully Alive by Mark Gaffney. But uh, Mark, before we get into this book, the world has changed radically since we last spoke two weeks ago. We're living in an entirely different world. Do you have any thoughts on this coronavirus? Yeah, yeah. No, thank you, Luke. And it's good to see you, friend. And, yes. you know, and perhaps we should spend the time actually talking about that because it's, it's beyond important. So, so let's just maybe start from the beginning. So the coronavirus is an expression of something, right? Obviously, it's a virus, it's a pathogen, and obviously it has, you know, physical correlates. But where did it come from? And what's it saying to us? And what's it inviting us to? So first, let's, let's trace it to its source. Its source is in the Wuhan province, right, in China. And if you actually look at the Wuhan province and you look at the clips of the open air live animal markets there, what you see is an enormous amount of split off suffering and pain. You have an, an, a poor population that can't afford food that's properly sanitized, that's properly prepared. You have animals that are slaughtered under the most brutal conditions in this open market and sold half alive, half bleeding, right, to right, a destitute population. And out of that suffering, you know, what I might call out of that kind of violation of intimacy, Right, that violation of intimacy, and I'm using the word intimacy, Luke, in the broadest sense. Right, we live in an intimate universe. Right, so it's a violation of the the core lines of connection between human beings. Right, this disowned, split off, destitute population between human beings and animals, and it's part of a it's symptomatic of a larger moment that we're in, and this larger moment that we're in, we might call it, Luke, a global intimacy disorder. And the global intimacy disorder, this global intimacy disorder is unlike anything we've ever experienced in history. This is not just another moment. There's a phase shift in history, right? In which we're actually experiencing, right? Eminent forms of two kinds of expressions. And one is catastrophic risk and the other is existential risk. And as you know, brother, catastrophic risk is something like the coronavirus, right? In which there's a catastrophe in which a global pandemic emerges. And because we're not connected to each other, because we're in a win-lose metrics in individual countries, it's ignored and it becomes immense and dangerous and deadly. It's catastrophic. But that's just a dress rehearsal, brother, for existential risk. And existential risk is rooted in nine or 10 different threats. One of them, of course, is climate events. Another is rogue terrorist events, right? A third is methane, right? On the tundra, you know, in Siberia, you know, a fourth is the, the extraction model in which you've extracted from the earth what took the earth billions of years to create. And, you know, the fifth is this exponential growth based on a win-lose metrics, right? Run by fractional reserve banking and closed loop systems and a linear materials economy, right? I mean, there's, right, the, the threats are real. And the result of existential risk will make coronavirus look like child's play. And, and so coronavirus is saying something to us. Of course, we have, to, we have to engage it and we have to engage it in the most powerful and, and effective way. And we have to save lives and that's clear. But we also have to go deeper. We also have to actually understand that when we don't actually choose the truth of a global ethic for a global civilization, if we don't actually articulate a shared human story, if we don't articulate a shared narrative of identity, a shared vision of value, if we don't begin to understand that that which unites us is so much greater than that which divides us, then actually we're going to be forced into the unbearable intimacy of global crisis. So there are really two choices at this moment. And the first choice is we actually begin to realize we live in an intimate universe, and we can talk more about what that means. And the book Return to Eros is in some sense about that. We live in an intimate universe and, and we're all actually fundamentally connected, but not just connected. 
We're all intimately connected, right? We're all part of each other. We all emerge from each other. We're all inter-included or interdigitated with each other. There is no ultimate separation, right? We actually live in an intimate universe and the universe itself seeks deeper and higher intimacies. The, the reality itself is the evolution of intimacy. Either we're, we're gonna understand that and we're gonna actually begin to heal the global intimacy disorder that's the source of the global action paralysis and the global action confusion, or we're gonna be forced into an unbearable intimacy that, that we'll have no way to understand and that will ultimately crush us as we collide with each other, unable to make sense as the gap between the haves and the have-nots expands and deepens, right? And as right, we actually begin to create literally new caste systems, right, in society, right? That's literally what we're moving towards, right? There'll be one part of society that has availability, available cash for augmentation and for machine learning and for AI, you know, artificial intelligence enhancements, right? And we'll begin to develop a kind of, you know, hyper cyberborg augmented population with actual microchips and with biometric sensors, which will actually become 20 to 30 years from now, standard for the elite, but everyone else is not gonna be able to afford it. We'll actually have to reintroduce through runaway technology, the case system in a shocking way. In 30 years, jobs aren't gonna be available, right? For most human beings, there aren't, most human beings are not gonna have jobs the way we know them. So if the challenge of the 20th century was exploitation, right, right the workers were exploited, the challenge is that most of reality is gonna become irrelevant in the 21st century. These are existential risks. So the coronavirus, right, it is a kind of, it's a kind of dress rehearsal. Can we come together? But not just to create a, a vaccine, right, to actually identify the pathogen, right, to, to counter the particular challenge, but to actually realize, look, the coronavirus is not distinguishing between young and old. Right? Ultimately, it's not going to distinguish between rich and poor. It has no boundary consciousness. Right? It connects us all. It, it reminds us we're all interrelated and interconnected. So there's this enormous invitation here. There's an invitation to actually to care, right? to love, right? to realize we're in an intimate universe, to realize that actually Bob Marley got it right. It's one love. It's one heart that every human being is a unique self, a unique expression of that love. In fact, to begin to tell a new story. And that is, maybe I'll conclude with that. We're in this Da Vinci moment, right? Da Vinci's in the Renaissance, right? In Florence. And they're at a time between worlds. They're at a time between stories. The Black Death, a pandemic, right, has actually taken out half of Europe. But what do you do in the face of the Black Death? And Da Vinci understands that he can't go into every village in Europe and heal it. But he realizes the only thing you can do in the face of that kind of pandemic is you can tell a new story, a new story about the relationship of God and man, a new story about what it means to be a human being, a new narrative of identity that derives from a new universe story. We've destroyed reality, my friend, right? We're either telling regressive stories, which are pre-modern, or we're telling modern stories, which have denuded reality of an actual mooring in ultimate values or we're postmoderns who have deconstructed all stories. There are no real narratives, right? So we've destroyed reality. We need to restore reality, but not just as a narrative. We need to actually integrate the best insights of pre-modern, modern, and postmodern wisdom streams into a larger whole, greater than the sum of the parts, which is actually a new universe story. And that's the invitation of Corona. So that's big, that's a big view. Right? It's a large view, it's a wider view, but it's actually where we are right now. This is catastrophic risk, but it's a harbinger. It's a prelude, right? bless you, right? to existential risk. And it's an invitation right? to actually become who we need to be. So thank you for, for prefacing with this, this critical and painful and poignant and fraught moment, which is filled with peril, but also has a promise, right? A potency, a potential beyond imagination.
Okay. So when you say, can we come together, do you mean all of humanity? Do you mean Americans? Do you mean Jews? Who do you mean? Well, first off, everyone has to come together, number one, in their own community, right? So the notion of a kind of a homogenized humanity, of course, is, is silly, right? We're a, we're a symphony, and a symphony has distinct instruments, right? But I've got to actually begin to have a wider field of identity. And I've got to come together first with whatever my ethnocentric community is, right? Whether that's my, my Jewish community, whether that's my American community, whether that's my Bulgarian community, right? So ethnocentric identity is important. Religious identity is important. When we come together and we, we make those identities real, right? That's the beginning, but it's not enough. We actually need to begin to articulate a shared human story, right? As for example, Judaism always did. Judaism always had a notion of a Jewish story and a universal story, right? A shared story in which there's a set of values, right? There's a set of visions that define us, that we actually understand ourselves through. And those have fallen apart, right? I mean, Luke, if you would ask me, which you haven't, right? But if you would ask me, why did Trump win the presidency, right? A complex question, right? And, and Trump is, is to major an understatement, a, a complex figure, <laughs> you know, right? But why, I mean, what happened? What happened, right? And part of what happened is, is that the liberal politics of America and Hillary Clinton's an enormously, enormously sophisticated and an enormously talented public servant. Let's kind of get beyond all of the, the hate Hillary absurdity, right? She's an enormously talented public servant with an enormously sophisticated sense of policy and, and a deep, good Methodist love for human beings. Why didn't she become president? She didn't become president because she didn't have a new story. Right? It's not enough to take care of victims, although we have to take care of victims, but we need a new story of identity, a new story of nobility, right? of honor, right? of, of courage, of vision. Right? Who am I? If you, we've got no answer to the question of who am I and who are we, then we're lost. And you can't deal with a pandemic, right? Which is in essence an expression of forced intimacy without actually stepping back and trying to understand how did we get here? And right? how did we get here? Right? We got here because there were lots of have nots, right? In, in this particular case, and those have nots didn't have food and those have nots didn't have food. So they, they ate contaminated food and that contamination spread. But that's just but one example Right? We live in a global world in which we're colliding into each other. There are no more local disasters. There are no more local catastrophes, brother. Right? Right? The true catastrophes of our age are global catastrophe. Right? On a scale that we can't even imagine. And remember, brother, we have exponential technology. And exponential technology can create exponential good, but if I can use the Latin phrase, it can also create exponential suck. But exponential technology creates exponential devastation. A bow and arrow can do so much, right? A patent tank can do so much. A B2, B-52 bomber can do so much, right? A rogue, a rogue nuclear drone, of which there are thousands more available, right, to non-state actors that were ever true in history. Think about that. But, but all this is happening outside of the context of a shared story, right, of a shared humanity that we all live in, that we're all bound towards, that we, we experience right, our relationship to as part of our identity and our obligation to as part of our nobility and honor. So there's a, there's a source code issue. And in much of the Jewish community, you know, and one of the things that's happened to you and me in a certain sense, you've stayed very deeply in the Jewish community in a very beautiful way. And I, although I, I practice Jewish, I put on tefillin every morning, right? I, I practice Shabbat, right, et cetera but I'm not associated, I'm not in the internal Jewish conversation. Right? And so I, I've kind of tried to widen the conversation. And the Jewish community in some sense, I haven't seen one article in the Jewish journal, right, since our friend David took it over, which actually was dealing with these issues, right? It's like the rest of the United States, it's dealing with local issues, but not with the broader question. And the broader question is what's our, what's our universe story? What's our narrative of identity? Right? What's the global ethic for a global civilization that's the only thing that can actually transform this moment in history, this phase shift moment in history? So that's how I understand the pandemic, brother. 
right? And of course, we need to respond to it with full dignity, right? With full love, with full coming together. Coming together means not just the very beautiful things that happened in Italy today and yesterday where people sang and did concerts from the rooftops, which is beautiful. Those moments are gorgeous. But we can only come together when we have a genuine shared story. And that's, that's the beginning. That's, that is the da Vinci moment that we find ourselves in, in this time between worlds, right? in this time between stories. So you're talking about a shared story. So that perhaps uh, presupposes how we understand humanity. Do we understand humanity as primarily individuals who are born into the world with, I don't know, certain inalienable rights to quote the Declaration of Independence? Or do we understand uh, humanity as primarily people born into specific families and, and tribal allegiances or, or, or nations? I mean, how, how are we ever going to have any story that speaks to everyone? Let's talk about that, right? So, so there is a great conflict right, in the history of planet Earth that you're pointing towards, you're pointing to one expression of it, which is this conflict that actually exists, Luke, actually way before human beings, right? It's the conflict between two forces in reality, which is autonomy, independence, individuation, and communion. And autonomy and communion are actually, Luke, two forces of reality from the first nanoseconds of the Big Bang. They actually exist, right, in the core physics and mathematical structures of reality. And actually, the way reality moves forward is through this balance between what we might call in terms of science, allurement and autonomy, or attraction and repulsion, or autonomy and communion. So those two forces, Luke, those are actually part of, we need to think deeper here, right? Right, the old way of talking about, right, the conflict between the communitarian, right, and the individualist, well, that's, that's a very old, outmoded way of thinking about it, right? Dennis is still thinking in those terms. That's old hat. We, we can think much, much deeper than that. We actually begin to realize, you no, know, there's actually two principles in reality. And those principles exist in all of us. And actually, we're both individuated. We might call that, if I would use a, a, a great thinker that I love madly, and I'm in deep reverence and devotion to, and I know this is a thinker that I'm sure has affected your world, right? Isaac Luria, the Ariya Kadosh, the mm -hmm. Holy Luria. So Luria talks about Igulim and Yosher, which is lines and circles, right? Lines and circles. So lines is individuation, right? Autonomy, right? Circles is obviously communion. And, and Luria writes that actually every human being in every moment is actually the Heros Gamos, right? The coincidentia oppositorium, right? Let's use an English word instead of a Latin word, right? The divine marriage, the zivu the way the Baal Shem Tov says it, right? The, the union, right, between line and circle. So we're both. And we actually can begin, right, to actually articulate, right, a universe story that takes this into account. I'm not suggesting, Levy, right, if I can call you Levy, if that's yes, okay. Yes, right? yes. I'm not yes. suggesting that we create a new dogma right, and then impose that dogma as a kind of world religion on people. That's just another totalitarian move that's not going to work. Now, what I'm saying is that we actually integrate the best of the traditional religions, right? the best of modernity and its insights, the best of post-modernity and her insights. We weave those three together, right? The core validated insights from all three of those and weave them together in a larger tapestry of meaning. And, and, and in essence, I'll, I'll, let me give you an example of a first attempt at that, okay? So you may be familiar with Tractate Sanhedrin, mm -hmm. the Talmud. The mm -hmm. Sefer Sanhedrin, right, as I would more normally call it, right? It's on Daf Nun Beit, right, right, 52a. There's this conversation. It's about the seven Noahide laws. Sheva Mitzvos B'nai Noach. And the seven Noahide laws are actually an attempt by the Talmud to codify a shared universal language. And for example, the seventh master of Chabad Hasidism, right, right known as, right, right, the, the, the last Lubavitcher Rebbe, as he's more popularly known, right, spent an enormous amount of time in campaigns, which was his word, for spreading this vision of Sheva Mitzvah B'nai Noach, the seven Noachide laws. Now, I don't agree with the Rebbe's, all of the Rebbe's interpretations, but I have, of course, great wild honor for the Rebbe and, and deep devotion. I mean, the first book I ever wrote was a 150, 200-page book on Tanya, 
and its relationship to Egeret HaKodesh, which is another major, right, Chabad epistle, right, written by the Alter Rebbe, right? And, and so I'm in great devotion to his work, but here I want to just point to his insight. His insight was that Judaism needs to be involved in articulating a wider language. And now whether every detail of his version of that wider language, you know, mediated through the seven Noahide laws is, is exactly what we need or not, that's besides the point. But his core intuition was right. And, and at this moment, what we need to do is actually articulate a broader language in which autonomy and communion, communion lines and circles actually both have a role, and both have a place. But we have an involved understanding of what it means to be an individual. We have an evolved understanding of what it means to be a community. Of course, we could talk about each one of those. What are, what are the stages of evolution, that what we call development in developmental thought? And there's about 100 developmental thinkers in the last 100 years, right? And again, these are all areas of thought missed by the usual thinkers I know that you hang out with in the Jewish world. No one's talking about development. No one's talking about structure stages of consciousness, right? We're talking about the same old things. We're not actually articulating a new shared language. So for example, there's about 100 developmental thinkers in the last 100 years who have tracked development stages, structure stages of development through different lines. And there's a kind of general shared understanding, which actually understands, you know, four or five major stages of development, right? And whatever I do is mediated through my stage of development. So for example, let's give you an example. So who do I love? Okay. So let's talk about community, which you mentioned. So am I egocentric? meaning my circle of shared love, felt love, care, and concern is for me and my survive and thrive people. So most Americans are egocentric, certainly most liberal Americans, right? And that's who do I love? Me, my family, my two friends, my partner, my right? And that's my, my survival thrival group. That's egocentric love. That's a structure stage of consciousness. But then we can actually jump, and this happens in a person, and it happens in history. I can jump from early clans, which were egocentric consciousness, or in the human being, right, the nascent human being, egocentric consciousness, I can jump to ethnocentric consciousness. I have an actual felt sense of care and concern, not just for my survive thrive group, but for my people, my tribe. Kol Yisrael, Arabi, all of Israel are responsible. And the word responsible is Arab, sweet. There's a sweetness, right? There's a broader, right, ethnocentric responsibility. Jews for Jews, Americans for Americans, Catholics for Catholics, French for French, Algeria for Algeria. That's beautiful. That's beautiful, right? And an ethnocentric, a sense of we've lost that. But Yoram Chazoni wrote a very, very good book, right, on nationalism, right? Kind of this the, the, the importance, right, of, of nationalist states, right, in a stable world and their ethical importance. And Yoram did a great job. That's ethnocentric, right? Love. That's ethnocentric intimacy. Right? But then I can go deeper. I can go beyond ethnocentric intimacy and take me to 1985, right? Luke, right? In the old days, right? Live Aid concert, Lionel Richie and Michael Jackson, right? We are the world, right? I've got an actual world centric intimacy, right? I've got, I actually have a felt sense of care and concern for every human being on the planet. But I can even leap farther and I can actually find what we would call brother. We would call this, and it's gorgeous, we call this, right, cosmocentric intimacy. And cosmocentric intimacy is a felt sense of love and care and concern, actually, for every, not just for every human being on the planet, but for the entire planet itself, for every animal, right, for every mammal, for the planet itself. Now, you might think, Luke, that I made this up, right? This is a, what happened to Gaffney, right? He used to be a serious, firm guy doing serious Jewish thought. And what's he talking to me about now? So will you give me permission for one more minute? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I'm going to read you a passage from Rav Cook. Okay, I'm going to translate it loosely for you, because I assume that most of your readership is, a, is an English-speaking yes. right, readership. Right? So listen to this, an unbelievable passage from a book called The Lights of Holiness. It's from volume two, right, section 444. Right? This is Cook, Abraham Cook, who was this great mystical thinker, maybe one of the greatest human beings that lived in the last 100 years. And he writes, there is a one who sings the song of his soul. That's egocentric, me and my people, my, me as an individual. There is a one who sings the song of his soul. And in his soul, he finds it all, full, complete spiritual satisfaction. That's level one. 
But then Cook says, and there is a one who sings the song of the nation, right? That's from egocentric to ethnocentric intimacy. He leaves the zone of his personal soul, which he doesn't find wide enough. And he attaches himself with tender love to the totality of the community. And together with her, he sings her songs. He suffers her pains. He takes delight in her hopes. He ponders high and pure ideas about her past and her future and investigates with love and wisdom of the heart, the inner content of her soul. So that's ethnocentric identity, right? It's ethnocentric intimacy. But he says, but that, but, but you can even, you can go deeper. You can develop higher. You can evolve more. And he says, there is a one who widens his soul even further, right? Beyond the tribe. And this is Rove Cook, right? This is an Orthodox, ultra-Orthodox chief rabbi, right? Not someone, right? He said, but I can go even, I can, I can be more than that. He says, there is a one who widens his soul even further until it expands and spreads beyond the boundary of Israel to sing the song of humanity. For his soul is continuously enlarged by the genius of humankind and the glory of man and woman's divine image. And he aspires towards man's universal purpose. That's that shared universe story I was talking about, right? That shared narrative of identity, right? That global ethos for a global civilization, right? And this, this third level, this third song, he, an he anticipates the higher holification of all of reality. And from this living source, what we've called here world-centric intimacy, he draws the entirety of his thoughts and explorations, his aspirations and his visions. That's world-centric intimacy, right? And then Cook goes on and he says, Luke, he says, and there is a one who rises even further than this in expansion until he joins himself in unity with all of existence in its totality, with all creatures. He doesn't allow for the Wuhan open market, which is abjectly cruel, or which sources virus and contagion, right? There is a one who joins himself in, in unity with all of existence in its totality. He doesn't allow animals to be right, cramped up, right, lambs for three months so they can barely move, right, or breathe and they're in racked pain so we can have lamb chop for one minute of pleasure, right? He's cut himself off from cosmocentric intimacy. No, Cook says there's a one who's even beyond world-centric intimacy, who joins himself in unity with all of existence in its totality, with all creatures and with all worlds. And together with all of them, he gives forth song, right? And there is a one, and this is Rav Cook, Rabbi Cook, right, this great mystic at his best, he says, there's a one who rises with all these songs, right? Egocentric intimacy, ethnocentric intimacy, world-centric intimacy, and cosmocentric intimacy. And of course, that's my language, ego, ethno, world, and cosmocentric intimacy. But I'm, I'm languaging what Cook is saying. And what he does is, right, he, he sings all of these songs, and he plays all of their melodies, and he pours life one song into the other, kol sason kol simcha, right? The sound of jubilance, right? And the sound, right, of joy. The sound of the soul, the song of the nation, the song of humankind, the song of the cosmos, all flow together within him all the time and at every moment. Isn't that beautiful? Mm. Yes. Uh... Right? Wow. So that's the coronavirus, right? Without that context, there's no conversation. Wow. Wow. <sighs> and, and, and notice, brother, this comes from deep in our sources, right? And that's, you know, that's in a certain sense what I've been doing this year, these years, right? It's different than when we talked right years ago, mm -hmm. right? Some, some things, something's percolating, something new is emergent, right? We call it chidush Torah. I'm saying new is emerging, but it's emerging from deep within our sources. Yay. Uh, so I think you would agree most people are naturally xenophobic and most people naturally <laughs> at best have a lack of comfort with people who are different than them. Would you say that's a fair assessment of the human condition? No, I wouldn't, right? I would say that people default to smallness. They default to contraction, right? When they don't have a wider story to live in, right? So I think it's absolutely true that Rousseau's myth of the noble universal savage is, is nonsense, 
and that, that a person will default to contraction if that's the only story they have. But stay with me deeper, okay? Stay with me deeper. I want to see if I can find something with you, okay? Mm -hmm. Let me see if I can enter through a door that, that might be a door that might work for you. Okay, how about this? So you remember the story of Yosef, of Joseph, right? Mm -hmm. Joseph, right? And his amazing technical dream coat, right? So the Joseph story. So Joseph's thrown into a pit, right? It's not, not a good story. It's chapter Laman Zion, 37 of the book of Genesis. We should study that story together once. It's a, a gorgeous story. And when Joseph's thrown into a pit, right? The text says, in Bomain. The pit was empty. It had no water. As I'm sure you know, right? The classical tradition of Midrash of wisdom masters say, well, what do you mean? The pit was empty. If the pit was empty. Of course it had no water. And since the biblical text, right, masters an understatement, if the text says the pit was empty, it doesn't need to tell us it had no water. So Rashi setting a Midrash says, Abo Reik, the pit was empty, Ainbo Maim and had no water. Maim Ainbo, Nechashim Vakravim Yeshbo. It didn't have water, but it had snakes and scorpions. It's an unbelievably important text, and it's part of a, a larger thread, right, of sacred text, which is something like this. Water is always eros. Water is always the wider story we live in. Water is the radical aliveness, right, that actually gives our sense a sense of self-evident goodness, truth, and beauty, self-evident meaning. So when there's no water, right, when the pit's empty, right, the universe doesn't tolerate a vacuum. And so the vacuum is always filled up. What's it filled up with? With contraction, with smallness, with pettiness, right? With snakes and scorpions. So when there's no wider story, Luke, right? So people then default to narrow senses of identity. And in a narrow sense of identity, the way I actually experience myself as living in Eros, meaning living alive, having a sense of identity, having a sense of self, is by placing you outside. So I draw a circle. Say the circle is the place of Eros. The circle is the experience of being on the inside. The circle is my sense of aliveness. If I can't really get into the circle, I'm not really in the circle, what do I do? I place someone else outside the circle to give myself the illusion of being inside the circle. Right? We call that scapegoating. We call it demonization, right? Actually, countries often use the Jews for precisely this notion, right? When there was a economic disaster, when the Polish peasants were about to rebel, when the Russian czars sought to calm the populace and they couldn't give them water and they couldn't give them eros, they couldn't give them a genuine meaning and quality of life. What did they do? They placed the Jews on the outside, demonized, scapegoated. And by placing someone else on the outside, it gives you this illusion of being on the inside, this illusion, right, of identity. Right? And so when we don't have a genuine shared narrative of identity, right, when we're just lost in polarizations, right? Well, well, then, of course, we default to narrow, contracted senses of identity. But the truth is, right, underneath, right, the human being has what the Rebbe of Chabad called, right, chelak elohi. Right? We, we literally participate in divinity. And we actually have the capacity right, to love beyond what we thought we could love, right, and to feel beyond what we thought we could feel, right, and to actually become more, right, there's a beautiful text, maybe I'll, I'll, I'll turn back to you, but I'll end with this, there's a, one of the most beautiful texts ever written in human history, it comes from Sefer Shemot, from the holy book of, of Exodus, when there's a description of the enlightenment of the community, we don't need just priests, the elite, we need a kingdom of priests. So, so we're at a moment in time where we need to stand for, for a kind of democratization of enlightenment, a democratization of greatness, a democratization of, of this new story, right? this new larger story that Cook is talking about in which we can locate ourselves. Sans a new story, you have xenophobia. Sans a new story, you have a win-lose metrics. Right? Sans a new story of meaning, you have a success story. Sounds a new story of meaning you've got a narrow romantic story. We need to move from the narrow romantic story, as important as it is, from the success story, as superficial as it is, but it has its place, to a wider story, which every human being is a unique self. Every human being is a 
a unique expression of the love, beauty, and love intelligence. That's the initiating and animating eros of all that is, right? Who is Luke Ford? Luke Ford is a unique expression of that initiating and animating energy of all that is that lives in you, as you, and through you, that never was, is, or will be again other than through you. Reality is having a lady experience, a Luke experience. And as such, Luke has irreducibly unique perspective, and there's an irreducibly unique quality of intimacy that is Lukeness, that has a capacity to give a unique gift that no one that ever was, is, or will be can give other than Luke Ford. And as such, Luke Ford can, in a particular way, stand in the abyss of darkness and say, let there, let there be light in a way that no one that ever was, is, or will be can do. But he can't do it alone. It's not just the lying quality that Luria talks about. It's not just autonomy. But, but actually, you, you can not just join genes, you can join genius, right? We can actually move from just procreating to co-creating. We can create actually not just an individual unique self, but unique self-symphonies, which are the self-organizing universe, self-actualizing towards a kind of planetary intimacy. And when we don't choose that planetary intimacy, Luke, it's forced upon us. That's what the coronavirus is. The coronavirus is a catastrophic risk realized because we actually split people, and in this case also animals, out of our circle of intimacy and thought it was okay. But in a global world, that doesn't work anymore. In a global world, we're all colliding. In a global world, right, we travel. In a global world, right, risk is catastrophic and global, and pandemic will become the new normal until we actually claim, right, a shared story, which allows for shared action and, and mutuality of pathos and shared pathos. So this corona epidemic is not a detail, right? It's actually symptomatic. It's a harbinger of the world to come, but it's an invitation to wake up in the most beautiful and gorgeous way that we could possibly imagine. And to be more than we've ever been, which is what Rev Cook is talking about. Cook says that, that revelation is constant. Cook talks about in Eider Hayakar, one of his most beautiful essays, he talks about democracy being an expression of ongoing revelation. So this new vision I'm talking about Right, this new universe story, this new narrative of identity, that's what Cook's talking about. Right, so what Cook's talking about, it's beautiful. And you can find it in Luria and you can find it in, in, in really, really, it's hidden, but it's there, brother. And this is the time when we find those texts and we reclaim them. Yeah. So I remember once this uh, gay reform rabbi stood up and said, my tradition teaches a message of radical inclusion and love. And uh, I read a little bit of our tradition and radical inclusion and love just, I, I, I largely missed out on that, but you sound like uh, you're saying that our, our tradition is one of radical inclusion and love. You no, know, that it's so much deeper than that, brother, right? In other words, every tradition, there's a unique self-symphony, right? And within the unique self-symphony, there are unique instruments to play. So the Jewish instrument is a critical instrument. It's the instrument that I play. And in my personal life, right? You know, um, I put on Phil and late today, unfortunately. But you know, so so I so I had them on only unfortunately four or five hours ago. It was a late day, right? But but what what am I putting my Tefillin for, right? Not everyone in the world puts on Tefillin, right? You know, Shabbos was over last night at eight oh seven, right? I could have left I could have left Judaism easily. Our our mutual friend David Suisa said to me four years ago when we met in L.A. He said, you know, you should write an essay of why you remain Jewish and Orthodox, right? So I, I completely believe in our unique instrument in the symphony and how we understand, for example, you raise an issue of sexuality, right? A particular issue, which obviously is not our topic right now, right? But how I understand that issue is, is, is gotta be worked out in accordance with the inner instrumentation of the Jewish instrument in the symphony. And then we gotta look at that issue like we look at any other issue. So we're not talking about, I wanna get this really clear. So stay with me close, okay? Mm -hmm. right? Right? We're not talking about a homogenizing, right, leveling of differences. Do you get that? That's, I didn't say anything about that, yes. which is how you interpreted it. I didn't say one word about that. I talked about a unique self-symphony in which there's distinction, in which there's uniqueness. And just like right, there is the unique self of a person, there's the unique self of a religion. And as Soloveitchik wrote, Rabbi Soloveitchik wrote in his gorgeous essay in 1964 called Confrontation, there's a unique singularity of every tradition that's actually culturally untranslatable. And what he meant was there's a quality of intimacy, there's a quality 
right, of mitzvah. Mitzvah means commandment, but mitzvah also means, Luke, as you may know, right, in kind of Hebrew Aramaic, tzavta, the unique way of being together, of intimacy that's generated, right, by this encounter with God and history, which is called Judaism. So I'm not in any way suggesting a leveling of differences. That'd be absurd, right? Intimacy seeks uniqueness. And, and, and Judaism is a unique incarnation, right, of this overarching impulse of divinity, right? And of course, we want to tune that instrument of Yiddishkeit, and we want to we want to develop it, and we want to right know how to read its score, and and we also want to do Chiddush Torah. We want to create new Torah, right? As Rav Nachman says, which means we want to write new scores, but within the context and parameters of of the true music. We can't or you can't be off tune, right? There's a certain resonance right to this instrument. So although I don't want to address that particular issue you raised, but we're not talking about a leveling of difference. We're talking about a unique self symphony. Now, in a unique self symphony, we all have a different instrument, and maybe some instruments are even better than others. Who knows, right? There's not a leveling of differences, but there is a sense that we're part of a larger whole, right? right? There is a sense that we're we're all playing music, right? and Maimonides. Right, you would agree with me. Maimonides was a was a, a decent, incredible Jewish source, right? Mm -hmm. Not bad. As we go, right? Yeah. So Maimonides was very careful, right? And he he made it very very clear in his guide to the perplexed. He made it very very clear that every great religion, right, is playing some dimension of music. It doesn't mean they're all equal. It doesn't mean that a Jew should go become a Buddhist, right? It means that Buddhism has 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 a revelation to it of some kind. Obviously, right? It's not just some cruel trick of history, right? We, we may disagree with certain important things. It means that, right, as Cook writes, or Cook writes, citing Maimonides, right, that Christianity and Islam, right, were also instruments, right, of the spreading of certain core ideas that were critical for history, right? And so there's a larger field of revelation. We're all playing music. And so we need to have a shared story. Right, right. There's got to be. There's the unique covenant, which is the covenant of destiny of the Jewish people, but there's also a, another covenant, right, which Soloveitchik talks about, which is a, a universal covenant. It's not just radical inclusion and a kind of reductionist, you know, leveling of differences, non-discerning, right, homogenizing, insipid, pallid. That's not what we're talking about, right? You got to trust me a little more than that, brother, right? We're talking about something far more sophisticated, far more beautiful. We're talking about a symphony, right, of spirit, right, in which we actually have a sense that there's a shared score, and we each play our own unique instrument in the symphony. And without that symphony of spirit, Luke, there's no possible way human beings have at this moment in history to confront, right, catastrophic risk, to confront existential risk. There's no way. There's no chance. Right, what's at stake is actually for the first time in history, brother, the survival of the planet. It's a big deal. And of course, as you know, the early Midrashim, right, were aware of the possibility. Right? When you and I talked, you know, I don't know, 2006, right, 2007, right, we, we spent a couple of days in Salt Lake City together way back in the day, right? The words existential risk were barely in the discourse, weren't they? And who was talking about existential risk? Almost nobody. Right, but now it's become clearer and clearer that something's changed. We're at a new moment in history, right? And so we actually have to begin to articulate, right, a shared human story, which allows within it and encourages and demands within it radical individuation, radical distinction. So uniqueness, the unique self of a religion is irreducible. And yet that uniqueness takes place in a broader field. Right? We're unique expressions of the field. We're not separate from the field. You get the difference? We can't separate ourselves from the field. That's just not true. But we need to be unique expressions of the field. Can you feel that at all? I'm, I'm, I'm You're working I'm, it. I'm working with you. Now, how, how, what does this look like in real life for regular people? <laughs> it, it, well, first off, we're all regular people, right? And so it means that in some sense, Luke, right, we all need to become dual citizens. Remember 100 years ago, if you had two passports, you get in a little trouble with the FBI, yeah. right? Because clearly, right, you're, you're betraying somebody someplace, right? You're not supposed yep. to have two passports, right? But today, 
we're in a world of dual citizenship, right? And do we need to be citizens, right? You know, and, and I believe that the best thing a person can do can be, right, a citizen of their native religion or their chosen religion, right? So to choose a religion or to be born into religion, they're both equally valid, right? It's beautiful. And I think committing to a religious language, right, is stunning. And I happen to believe that not all religions are the same. Some are better at certain things and others are better at other things, right? And not all revelations are the same, right? And not all things that all religions say are true, lots are not true. And I think that the authentic stream of Judaic revelation is unbelievably important and unbelievably beautiful. And I bow in, in devotion before Chazal, before the great sages and the great masters. And, now stay with me, okay, and, so there's a famous Igeret Rav Shura Gaon, famous one of the great Gaonim, right, before the Rishonim, before, let's say, the Rambam. And he writes that everything that happens in the world happens for the sake of the Jews. So I don't believe that, Luke. That's just not true. It's not true that a couple making love in China on the beach are doing it for the sake of the Jews. Not true. It's a mistake, right? Actually, right, actually, people have their own dignity and nations have their own stories, right? And, and the person who understood that best was Cook. That's the passage I just read to you. Ultra-Orthodox rabbi living in Jerusalem and then living in Yafo, right, near Tel Aviv. This is not some radical fringe, right, you know, Jewish Protestant idea, right? This is from the depth of orthodoxy that I just read you that holy text, right? There's, there's some who sing the song of the individual person. And they're living their life and putting on their tefillin and doing their thing, which is beautiful. And other people really identify with Kalal Yisrael, with the, let's say with their people, let's say with the Jewish people in this much bigger way. And, and we sing and dream the songs of the nation. And then there's a third person who sings the song of the world. We don't leave the song of the individual or the song of the nation behind, but it's actually, we are the world. And every human being on the face of the planet. And then there's a fourth person who sings the song of the cosmos and who worries about those animals in Wuhan, right? in Wuhan, in the open markets. And it's not okay. It's not okay, right? That animals are brutalized and subject to abject suffering and people who can't afford better food have to eat them. That, ex that results in a plague. That results in a virus, right? And we can't, there's no externalities anymore, Luke, right? And what we used to do is we used to externalize harm. We lived our lives and we externalized harm. That's called externalities in business. There's no externalities anymore. You know, Master Dogen, who was, um, and Rav Cook has a, a healthy respect for the, the holy integrity of Buddhism at its best, even though, of course, like myself, he disagreed with much of the core. But Master Dogen once wrote, and Rav Cook wrote it in a similar way. He said, enlightenment is intimacy with all things. Right, Luke, there's not an actual possibility today to leave people out of the circle. We can't, we're, we're living in a global world, friend. That old world's not true anymore. It's just not true, it's just wrong. It's not like, oh, different opinions, it's wrong. It's not true, right? There's a global world, right? And we need to actually think globally right? and act locally, right? And, 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 and be madly committed to the development of Yiddishkeit and to the development of our unique instrument. But we have to be dual citizens. So practically, I actually have to experience myself as a dual citizen. I'm part of my nation, part of my tribe, part of my people. I'm also a citizen of the world at the same time. We've got two passports. And both of those passports are holy. And both of those passports are real, right? Rav Soloveitchik called that the covenant of faith, which was for him being a global citizen, the shared fate of the world, and the covenant of destiny, right? Brit Goral and Brit Yud, right? And so this, this, this is a kind of language you don't hear often in the Jewish community anymore, right? These texts have gotten lost. And of course, I've reclaimed them. And of course, I've relanguaged them. So you're right about that. I have relanguaged them. And you can sense that relanguaging. And I've also tried to invest them with, with fresh meaning and fresh energy and fresh resonance. But the core, the core brother, is at the, the very depth of the tradition. This is where we are today. Anyone who's not a dual citizen is going to be alienated from reality. Right? And reality itself won't survive, won't survive an evolution of identity. It won't survive our failure to enact a shared universe story, a shared narrative of identity. I'm going to just give you one example. Just one simple example, okay? Let's agree that you and I would be unhappy if one of those Avenger movie scenarios happened. I don't remember which one this was. It was about, I don't know, seven, eight years ago. 
in which one of the key figures decides that he has to cull the herd, much like it almost looks like they were going to do in Great Britain in the coronavirus. I don't know mm -hmm. if you track it all, right? Like, wow. Yeah. Right? Like, wow. Right? Like, uh, herd immunity? Hello? Herd yeah. immunity doesn't work that way. Right? That was, that was a frightening, a frightening kind of eruption of pseudoscience and weird dystopian, right? You know, weird dystopian thinking kind of finding its way, right, into the public eye for a moment and then being shunted aside. But I know myself of conversations, super high level conversations by some of the key families in India who are talking about calling the herd, right? Right, that scenario, right? You remember the, the Avengers Endgame? Remember that huge movie a year ago? What was it about? What was Thanos' position? Thanos' position was called the herd. And if you notice, the Avengers didn't have a good argument with them. You got to get rid of half of the people in order to restart. That seemed like a strange, not by accident, that movie was playing in the intimate universe at this moment, right? There's hashkacha, there's divine providence in the world, right? So how are we going to stop the calling of the herd, Luke? Especially when, as we said earlier, with machine learning, right, and augmentation, right, and artificial intelligence, right, right, we're actually going to obsolete most jobs in the world, right, and as we said earlier, the threat is going to be not exploitation as in the 20th century, but irrelevance. So let me ask you a question. When there's a climate event, when there are no basic resources and necessities, right, available, right, and there's no shared narrative of human identity, which says that every human being has irreducible dignity as a unique self. And we haven't actually landed those in the source code of culture. What do you think is going to happen, Luke? It's not going to be pretty. It's going to be the biggest right, violation of the sacred ever known in human history. It's a big deal. So I'm not talking about, I'm not talking about some abstract, utopian, you know, philosophical meandering. I'm talking about the need. Right in this Da Vinci moment in time, right for a new Renaissance, and a new Renaissance, which is how we actually dealt with the Black Death, which actually tells a new story, and it's only the telling of that new story that's going to allow us to respond to existential risk and to catastrophic risk. And if I can challenge you a little bit, brother, mm -hmm. is that okay? And I mean that sure. with, you know, with full love. You're thinking an old game, right? I can hear it, right? But I was thinking this way 15 years ago, and everything you say is right. But you're asking questions from an old world, right? Right. Let's take it as a given that we both love Yiddishkeit, right? And you're probably going to be playing a more active role in it than I will, right? For this incarnation, right? But I'm going to put on my tefillin every day with you, and I'm going to be, do what I can. I'm going to actually talking to a to a close friend. And I'm going to publish a whole set of Jewish books, which hopefully will have share something in the Jewish world. But I'm going to, right? So let's let's take it. We're not talking about homogenizing. We're not talking about leveling of differences. But actually, we need to be able to think bigger and wider, like Cook did, like Soloveitchik did, like the Midrashim did, like Maimonides did. And we need to be able to enact a new language, right? Because without that, Luke, we don't stand a chance. These are not abstract issues. These are the existentially pressing issues of this moment in time, a moment unlike any that we've ever met in history. Because remember, it's not that there weren't crises before, but we didn't have exponential tech, Luke, right? We didn't have rogue drones, right? We had, I mean, right? We have now exponential tech, which creates exponential disaster, right? We have a, we have a society driven by win-lose metrics that drives exponential growth. And that win-lose metrics is going to take us down, right? With complicated systems and not complex systems. That's another distinction we won't go into for now. But like, this is, this is, the, this is the reality of today. Right? This is actually what's up for regular people. And what coronavirus is saying is, friends, regular people, right? You can actually put your head down right, and ignore and what's happening and not take your seat at the table of history and pretend like you didn't know. But actually, right, the world's changing and it's changing so rapidly fast and no one's voting on it, Luke. Who voted on the internet? Who's voting on artificial intel intelligence, right? Who's voting on augmentation? Right? Who's voting on obsoleting jobs? No one. Right? I mean, Trump's going to put a, a wall at the border. Congratulations, brother. But the issue is not the wall at the border and Mexicans were going to take away American jobs. That is not the issue today. That is so behind where the world is. 
so doesn't see where we're going, coronavirus is, is a wake-up call. And it's a wake-up call to actually engage the unbearable intimacy, what it means to be a human being today on planet Earth. That's uh, what we we only off. have very limited uh, time. We yeah, only we'll, have... we'll, get book, we'll get to the book next time, hey? Yeah, but uh, it's it's amazing. Well, let, here, let's here, let's just get a quickie on it. So, the, the subtitle here is on sex, love, and eroticism in every dimension of life. That sounds incredibly dangerous to me. That reads like you know, on the power of dynamite <laughs> in every dimension of life. <laughs> so, so that's that's too good of a question, right? All right, for a trite answer. Okay. Okay. So I'm not going to give it a try answer, but I will say is that if you're up for a second conversation, yes. I'll be happy to respond. And I would just say one thing, okay? That idea, right, in the title, another way to express that idea in Judaic terminology is Galuta Shechina, the exile of the Shechina. Now, the Shechina, as you know, right, the feminine goddess divine, the Shechina, the, right, the dimension of the Godhead that is the feminine force. One good way to talk about Shekhinah is Eros. And what Eros means we have to talk about more deeply. But let's just think about Eros for a second as the experience of the being and becoming of reality. We'll talk about it more deeply next time. The experience of radical aliveness moving towards larger holes that drives all of reality. That's the Shekhinah dimension of divinity. So that experience of radical aliveness, right? We can exile to sexuality. Right, right. Where are you going to find that in sexuality? And you may be familiar with the fact that you know there are there are there's an entire right pornographic universe out there, which is about the exile of the Shekhinah. <laughs> right. And this is not about this is not about good, bad, it's not a discussion on the pornographic universe, but it's it's exiling eros to sexuality. What's dangerous, what's dynamite is, and in the worst way, what's destructive is when we exile the erotic to the sexual. Paradoxically. The conservative position, right? The true position of religion is to liberate Eros from its exile in the sexual, to liberate the Shekhinah from the pornographic universe, and to actually experience Eros in every dimension of life. So, for example, in this conversation today here with you, I could feel the quality of your listening. I could feel the quality of your kind of working with the ideas. And so it created a space between us which poured energy into me, which clarified the idea. So this was an erotic experience, right? Not a sexual experience, an erotic yeah. eros, a Shekhinah experience. So that's at least a, a fragrance of where that book's going. And if you're up for it, right, yes. give me a buzz yeah. and I'd be yeah. delighted to talk yeah. about it. Okay, thank you. So Mark, uh, Mark Gaffney, author of A Return to Eros, The Radical Experience of Being Fully Alive.